and welcome to Frankly Speaking, the show where we dig deep into the insights of some of the leading policymakers in the Middle East and indeed the world. I'm Frank Kane. Today, I'm joined from Washington, D.C. by Reza Pahlavi, Crown Prince of Iran in exile, who is going to share his expert views on the current state of that important but volatile country. Your Highness, welcome to Frankly Speaking. Hi, Frank. Good to be with you. You too. Uh, many thanks for coming on the show. Uh, let, me, let me dive straight into it. Um, you told the Sunday Times newspaper in January 2020 that the regime in Tehran is cracking from the inside. Of course, we're now nearly 18 months later. We have a much more uh, lenient U.S. administration. Tell me, frankly speaking, do you still think the regime is cracking or are the Ayatollahs here to stay? Look, any totalitarian system history has shown doesn't last. We saw the end of the Soviet empire. We saw the end of apartheid. We saw the end of many totalitarian regimes and the Islamic regime is no exception. It's just a matter of time. Uh, you have to understand that today we have the youth of the country who simply want a different life opportunities and everything they're dreaming of, this regime stands in obstacle. Uh, the regime, of course, has maintained repression uh, as a means of trying to terrorize the nation, but to no avail. Today, we see the chance for freedom more and more, louder and louder in every corner of the country. And that is indicative of the fact that not only the regime has lost its legitimacy, but it's beginning to lose its grasp as well. On, in the current situation, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, the JCPOA, has been a fixation uh, of the current Biden administration, hasn't it? What's your view on the current version of that plan compared to the previous version? Well, in essence, one has to understand that everything, and not just limited to the JCPOA, but the overall uh, uh, confrontation of the free world vis-a-vis -vis the problematics caused by this regime, as it was always set on the premise of behavior change. And an expectation of behavior change by this regime is what is in essence uh, flawed. Uh, this regime cannot change its behavior because its entire existence depends on its uh, viral state of wanting to export an ideology and dominate the region either directly or via proxies. It is therefore incapable of coming to terms with the way the world wants to see the norm. So regardless of what is trying to be negotiated here, uh, the net outcome is that it's futile and the regime is simply using whatever it is as a means of blackmail, forcing the world to deal with it so it can continue maintaining its uh, grip uh, uh, in the geopolitics of, of our region. Okay, we'll get on to the, uh, the exportation uh, of terror a bit later. But in the current uh, circumstances, what would your advice be to the Biden administration to achieve uh, the best results from where we are now? There is a direct correlation between the regime backing down and the amount of pressure exerted on it. We have seen, in fact, that for the most part, uh, increased pressure on the regime has forced it uh, to either curtail its ability to, to do whatever it wanted to do. Any relaxation, to the contrary, emboldens it and enables it to further its uh, uh, constant state of creating instability in the region, as we have recently witnessed in the recent clashes uh, uh, um, where rockets have been fired on Israel and things of that nature, and of course, Yemen and many other examples we can uh, uh, point to. As a whole, uh, while attempting to find a solution, albeit just limited to the nuclear issue, which should not be limited to it, and that's a different argument altogether, but you cannot have any uh, sense of uh, net result by going back to the same concept where today probably half of the uh, components of the former JCPOA have, have expired and you're trying to get uh, same results with lesser means. In other words, uh, the, in the, the status quo is not favoring the world, but it's favoring the, the regime, unless something in the dynamics of that changes. And I think the only way to be able to at least get more results is not by la laxing pressure, but on, to the country exerting pressure. This is not just from the point of view of the outside we're looking in, 
It is also in the interest of a population that is paying the price every time the regime gets uh, a second breath. Throwing the regime a lifeline is not the way to go. It will be net, net, lose, lose for the people of Iran and the free world, only to the benefit of the regime. Okay, that's, that's an interesting point. Uh, so uh, should things go well for the current regime in these negotiations uh, and economic links are restored to the rest of the world, um, do you think that, they, that Tehran uh, will use the cash that it gets from that restoration for the benefit of its people? Or will it continue to finance terror groups and militias around the region? Well, I think we have seen that happen already once uh, during the Obama administration, where a tremendous amount of money was released uh, to the regime and none of it was spent on the people of Iran. Why people are starving in the streets and we see images of it every single day by social media or other output. The money was spent on pretty much uh, reinforcing the regime proxies in the region, in Syria and elsewhere. And uh, it, I don't see any reason why all of a sudden the regime will say, oh, mea culpa, from now on we're going to take care of our own people. It's just not part of its uh, raison d'etre. As I said, the regime from the get-go did not look at itself as a government for a state, but more as an agent of exportation of an ideology. And as such, the people of Iran have always been compromised and have not been part of the regime's consideration. I'm trying to understand the Iranian mindset here. Um, and do you see any justification for the uh, ir Iranian support for uh, Houthi terror groups firing missiles into Saudi Arabia, uh, or indeed uh, from uh, Hezbollah and, and Iraqi militia groups too? Is there any rationale for this? Well, if, you're in, if in your mind you separate where the people of Iran stands and the national interest of our country, vis-a-vis -vis what is the interest of the regime and where it stands in its uh, views, you're talking about the two separate worlds. The regime, of course, has every interest to continue fomenting instability because its survival depends on that. To the people of Iran, on the other hand, our national interest depends first and foremost on, on having stability and peace and cordial relationship on, with our neighbors, as opposed to constantly meddling into their internal affairs by uh, various means of uh, interference. Uh, that is very clear. Suffice it to say that if you compare where Iran was before the revolution and its relationship with our immediate neighbors and beyond the world, it was a totally different story as opposed to since the regime uh, came to power and every irritation, conflict, confrontation that as a result of its behavior, it has created, which unfortunately is the people of Iran who have to pay the price for it. Let's move on to what might replace that uh, situation. In a recent interview with Voice of America, uh, you proposed uh, that in the future, Iran has an elected monarch. Tell me how this system might work in your mind. But the principle is essentially a democratic system which is based on sovereignty and the will of the people, like everywhere else in the world when we see democratic governments, irrespective of its final form. You have countries that are republics, you have countries that are parliamentary monarchies, from Japan to Sweden to Germany to the United States, albeit they are slightly different from one another because of the specificities of that particular nation and its population and its uh, fabric, if you will. So the, the, the basic principle here is that whatever in the future we would like to attain in a secular democratic alternative to a the theocracy that we are currently having in our country is for the people of Iran to ultimately decide the final form so long as the content is democratic. Which is why I have uh, uh, asked my fellow compatriots, whether Republicans or monarchists, that in the future to put forth their best uh, model or proposition as to what the final form could be so that the Iranian people this time would clearly have all the alternatives and options available to them before they cast their final vote in a referendum to ultimately determine the, the final form. So this is the really real principle that we need to uh, uh, think of and th the democratic process will take care of the rest. In other words, once the regime collapses, we anticipate a period of transition where a temporary government will have to manage the country's affairs while a constituent assembly will draft a new constitution, put to debate all these issues that are to be discussed so that the people of Iran ultimately have a choice of how and what 
uh, that will determine the future. My issue, however, is that whatever the final form, the premise has to be something that ends up being a choice or a selection or an election by the people in order to have full legitimacy and be consistent with democratic principles. So it's a way of uniting Republicans and monarchists. Is that how you see it? Is, is that a viable power block within uh, the, the Iranian political system? In a pluralistic society such as Iran, it is uh, obvious that regardless of your ideological preferences, what transcends political divisions is the national interest and commonality of collective survival in a democratic system. Without a democracy, without human rights, we cannot achieve all the goals of peace, stability, and progress. That's a precondition to Iran's positive future. In that, any Iranian, regardless of uh, opinion, uh, have a common uh, platform and agenda, I believe. What role would you see for yourself in this? Do you see yourself as this elected monarch? Um, or would you support an alternative candidate, perhaps somebody who, uh, who, who can unite the Iranian people? What do you think? I have said to my fellow compatriots throughout the years, I'm not running for any office. The only mission that I have in life is to assist the process of reaching the point that I was talking about where people can ultimately choose for themselves uh, their future. My only mission in life is to get to that finish line, which is the liberation of Iran and post this regime have an opportunity to establish a new secular democratic system in our country. That day will be the end of my political mission in life. Okay, uh, uh, regardless of who the elected monarch or the president is, uh, uh, do you think that Iran can ever abandon theocratic rule? Uh, have the Ayatollahs eternally changed the DNA of the country? No, I think it's quite the contrary. I think uh, religious governance has created a situation where people are staring away from religion. In fact, the, 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 there is much more apathy vis-a-vis -vis any uh, religious sentiments as a result of this regime directly trying to force or politicize religion and, and impose it on the public, uh, in the public sphere. Religion is something personal and private, and that's the reason why it should be separate from uh, anything uh, in the public sphere. Iranians have learned it the hard way. And uh, I think today you see that uh, uh, even those who are pious in Iran don't want this regime because they see the damage that it causes uh, to people's uh, faith and to the establishment of, of um, the clerical establishment. Many clerics who happen to be secular in the sense that they also believe that religion has no place in governance agree with that. Only the very few who happen to advocate what this regime stands for and are the only ones in power, by the way, uh, would argue that. But today, I think uh, after 40 years, uh, Iranians have learned their lesson. It is sad that we had to experiment with uh, theocracy but then again, when I think of Europe and the medieval times and uh, the Inquisition, uh, enlightenment and the period of uh, Renaissance came as a result of, at the time, a Christian theocracy. And this time it's the Islamic kind. It's the Islamic Inquisition that Iran is now at the end of the tunnel coming out. And in that sense, a separation between what religion is and what governance should be is becoming more and more clear and asked for. Uh, by my fellow compatriots, particularly today's generation who has much more access to information and analysis and study and debate, uh, fortunately, uh, with the help of technology and social media. Very interesting point. Uh, just in terms of how the country currently works, in a recent uh, leaked recording, Javad Zarif, the foreign minister, uh, exposed what many people thought was an open secret for a long time about how the country works. Uh, that the government is a puppet in the hands of the Supreme Leader and Revolutionary Guards. Were you surprised at that leaked recording? What are your thoughts on that? I don't know if I would say I was surprised, but in a way I was glad that when somebody from the regime itself is uh, dismantling this uh, naive uh, uh, expectation by the Western world that moderates will be able to resolve the issues should they be in a position of control, he pretty much said, hey, there's no such thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a totalitarian system at the end, uh, depending on the decision of one supreme leader, and that has always been the case. 
Therefore, there's no possibility of anything that the world can think that maybe internally within this regime, any solution could be reached. I think that attestation pretty much threw uh, uh, you know, water on the remaining cinders of a fire that has died. Some people say that uh, Iranian hatred for Arabs uh, wouldn't, changed, wouldn't change no matter who is in power in Tehran. Is that true? I don't believe that for a second, because I think that a nation like Iran, who has a long history of uh, civilization, of culture, of tolerance within itself, uh, has never had an issue of antagonism vis-a-vis -vis any other uh, culture or uh, nation um, in order to be able to find its own identity. We had that in our own country, including the Arabs, whether they were Iranian Arabs or Arabs in uh, the immediate region. This regime is the cause for this friction and, and conflict. It's a sort of a, something that has poisoned the well and has uh, uh, manipulated minds. But if you think of the average Iranian thinking of what the relationship can be with our neighbors in the Persian Gulf and our immediate area, why would they have any reason to have a need for antagonism in order to uh, obtain what they want for themselves. In fact, I think to the contrary, the more we have cordial relationship with our uh, neighborhood, the more quickly can we jointly uh, tackle the challenges that we all face. Let me give you a simple example. Long before we can resolve the political crisis in terms of imperative, which of course it is, we should worry about water crisis that exists in our area. This is not only Iran, but many other countries also suffering from water crisis problems. If Iran today was a different Iran, you wouldn't have missiles being shipped to Yemen. We would have scientists, including Israeli experts who are the best in the field, working at resolving the water crisis for our respective countries. So imagine the change of scenery that can all depend only on this regime no longer being in place, creating all the problems that we are facing, including this kind of uh, frictions uh, that is a result of its uh, on, uh, negative influence. In particular with Saudi Arabia, uh, should you ever come to power or the system that you advocate come to power, how would you see uh, future relationships with the kingdom? Well, as I said, uh, look at the way the relationship was before the revolution, when King Faisal of Saudi Arabia passed away, there was a seven day mourning uh, period uh, in Iran even more than the Saudis themselves. That's the extent of what the relationship was. Had it not been for the role Iran played, you would not have had Camp David and the peace be between Sadat and Begin uh, that started the process uh, between uh, Egypt and Israel and many other examples that I can cite for you. Um, that means that uh, it's, it's the people haven't changed, the regime has. And as a result of it, uh, it's uh, impact, negative impact in the region. We can certainly uh, anticipate a future where uh, mutual respect, uh, cordial relationship is uh, conducive to better trade, better commerce, more opportunities, uh, improving people's lives, standard of living, healthcare, regional stability, security coordination, and many things that will enable us to instead of being in a position of constant fear and conflict from each other, an element of trust will lead to cooperation in many areas. And that's the nature of the, the relationship. If you look at where the way, for instance, uh, Europe is today and the relationship between its, uh, the membership within the European Union and uh, the way democratic principles enables these uh, countries not to be in conflict with each other, because democracies usually don't go at war with each other. Uh, the result is uh, peace. The re result is prosperity. The result is uh, increase in technology and many other uh, things. Which countries that are not thinking in that sense and, be, and, and remain in an axis of resistance are deprived from it. North Korea, Syria. How many examples can we find that will pretty much indicate uh, the net difference between opportunities under democratic relationship with, and cordiality of relationship between such countries as opposed to under totalitarianism, what can happen as a result? Thank you. Uh, in a recent interview, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia said that the kingdom hopes to build positive relations with Iran while he objected to some of its negative behavior. Iran, of course, welcomed those statements verbally, 
but did nothing to change its behaviour. Do you think the current regime in Tehran is capable of abandoning what it sees as almost a divine mission to interfere in the affairs of others and to destabilise neighbouring countries? No, as I said, and to reaffirm what I said earlier, the DNA of this regime is such that in order to survive, it cannot do anything other than what it is currently doing. If it ceases to do all that it's done so far, it will no longer be uh, an agent of exportation of an ideology with the hope of creating a modern day Shiite caliphate that will dominate the region and beyond. That's their mission statement. That's what you find within uh, the annals of, of what this regime stands for. Again, let me emphasize, we're talking about the regime, not the people. And I think any leader in the world, whether regional or otherwise, that has acknowledged and in their mind separated the Iranian people from this regime, have got the message and could in fact convey that message that we know the difference. And I don't know if uh, what uh, 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 King Ben Salman has said is in fact indicative of that distinction, but it's at least a message. And I think it's a message to the people of Iran more than it is a message to the regime. Because from the very beginning, the first countries that was antagonized in the region by Iran was Saudi Arabia from the get-go. So I think the message, uh, if indeed it is what I assume it is, uh, will certainly be well received by the people of Iran. And whether the regime responds to it or not is besides the point, because as I said, what's really relevant is what the people of Iran will think of it, what the regime thinks about it, because the regime is on its way down and sooner or later people will be free in Iran and they will be the ones uh, to have to uh, choose and respond to this gesture. And if the gesture is uh, cordial as opposed to hostile, of course we'll welcome it and we'll re re reciprocate uh, in kind. Okay. Okay. It goes without saying. Have you been following the, uh, uh, the reforms that have been going on in Saudi Arabia uh, in, in recent years, the uh, Vision 2030 strategy uh, and all the reforms uh, and liberalization that's gone with that? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I cannot be uh, more happy to see that uh, evolution and the Abraham Accords and everything that comes after because we're in the direction of progress and uh, regional uh, cooperation and opportunities. That's exactly what's the dream of an Iranian. And I would believe probably a Syrian or an Iraqi who are stuck with the axis of resistance that keeps them from having such opportunities where other nations are moving forward are readjusting uh, uh, the circumstances not to depend on oil as a major source of revenue and readjusting their economies and having plans for the future. And all of that in conjunction and cooperation with each other that's the model to follow. And Iran could certainly and would want to be part of that once it's freed from this regime that is an obstacle uh, for that. There was a time where people in Dubai were dreaming of coming to Tehran to go to our supermarkets and, and, and shop in our major stores. Today, it's the dream of every Tehrani to go to Dubai and move away from Iran. It's a reversal of situation. Why? Because they see the contrast. It's a little bit like the difference between North Korea and South Korea. I remember seeing on the map uh, a picture taken at night uh, that was published in National Geographic's magazine. And it's astounding when you look at a, a night picture, you see illuminated bright lights in South Korea. And all of a sudden there's a line and everything above that line, which is that parallel of the TMZ, is uh, black. I mean, opportunity versus lack of opportunity. I think that image is quite telling where the trend is and where people want to be. And I don't care if you are Egyptians or Iranian or Syrian, that's a matter of opportunities and relationship. And the example needs to be followed. And I think Iranians are picking up on that to the detriment of the regime, of course. I remember uh, exactly the picture that you're talking about. Uh, tell me a bit more about Israel, if you would, and, and the Abraham Accords. Was it, there does seem to be a a deep-rooted uh, uh, hatred of Israel uh, in the current Iran. Um, how, how do you see the, the Abraham Accords? I know you've mentioned them, just tell me a bit more. Uh, and, and would a new Iran follow suit with the countries like, like the UAE and Bahrain and others who have normalized relations with Israel? 
Well, uh, well before the Abraham Accords hit the scene, there were footages, multiple footages that we have seen in social media coming from Iran, where students in universities who at the entrance and the gate of their campus have the American flag and the Israeli flag painted on the floor, so they would have to walk over it on their way to classes, are avoiding it and are trying to step uh, aside from having to step on those flags. That's the message within Iran. When you hear slogans like, neither Gaza nor Lebanon, my life for the cause of Iran, or Khamenei, uh, give up, leave Syria alone. Uh, it's a lie that they say America is the enemy. Our enemy is right here. I'm translating all these slogans for you. This is what the Iranian people have been chanting for the past two, three years. That would be indicative to you of where their mindset is, as opposed to a regime that needs to be antagonistic and viral and puts under question the survival and existence of Israel as a country. Um, you couldn't be more night and day difference between where the regime is and where the people are. So again, let me reiterate that. And the Israelis know that, by the way. I think many Israelis, including the current leadership, knows full well that the Iranian people have no animosity vis-a-vis -vis Israel. It's the regime that, uh, that does uh, have this animosity. Because again, because of its agenda, because of its survival depending on that. So whether it's Ben Salman, whether it's Bibi Netanyahu, whether it's anybody else looking at Iran, they know full well that once Iran is liberated, the people of Iran will be the first to say, hey, we have no quarrels with you. We want to be your friends. We want to be part of the free world as opposed to a regime that has forced us to submission and is attempting to claim that it's speaking on our behalf where it is not. Which is why today you see that there has been an unprecedented unity over a unifying uh, slogan and campaign of no to the Islamic Republic, which has been perhaps the most significant thing that happened ever since this revolution and is leading today to a boycott of the current elections. It is unprecedented, and that shows the scope of where the people of Iran today, in an unprecedented unified way, stand in their majority, I mean, overwhelming majority, against this regime that is represented by a very few that are trying to cling on to power by any means or design, but that will be futile as well. You mentioned the oil market. Let me just ask you briefly about that, if you would, uh, because uh, Iran is a major producer. Uh, used to be a major exporter, uh, but re in, in recent months, it seems to have almost piggybacked on the discipline that Saudi Arabia and OPEC Plus have brought back into oil markets. Um, but it still isn't part of the OPEC Plus grouping. It's not, not uh, a, a part of those output uh, uh, agreements. When will Iran become, again, a responsible full member of the global oil community? Well, again, if... if if there are certain preconditions for a country to obtain the kind of status where it becomes attractive for investment, where it can have uh, more trade, uh, a specific banking system that allows for all former shapes of, 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 of relationships, it, it goes back to the, not only the, the, the behavior of, of, of the system, but the transparency, the accountability, and many other factors um, that would certainly uh, give you the kind of rating, if I could call it that, in terms of whether or not this country is, is uh, willing, able, and capable of, of addressing uh, such uh, relationships and challenges. So it, 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 it falls upon us Iranians to put forth the kind of system that will not only be uh, protecting our national interests, but it will also be the kind of system that the rest of the world can deal with. Uh, and of course, uh, we cannot hope to have anything close to that again, uh, so long as this uh, mafia-like uh, paramilitary uh, system uh, where there's a symbiosis between the clerical leadership and its uh, apparatus of uh, repression and force and an IRGC that is basically uh, a commerce-driven, <laughs> uh, you know, sort of uh, security type uh, apparatus. Uh, has created this uh, overall uh, asphyxiation, uh, repression, uh, and overall corruption um, that is a net result. Once you eliminate that from the scene, we're back to transparency, we're back to, to 
through accountability. We're back where the Iranian people can feel safe about their money not being uh, burnt out uh, in, in accounts that they thought they had under control, but the, the, their money has now somehow disappeared. Everything hinges upon that. So, um, yes, I think uh, the, the short end of the story is uh, as, uh, the minute we can uh, implement uh, those uh, changes under same governance that cares and worries about the, the best interests of Iran, uh, we have to be able to adjust to these standards so that the world can feel comfortable dealing with us. Uh, I have a final question for you. Uh, what essential message do you have for Iranians who might be watching this and who have had enough of the current regime, who are fed up with the current regime? What is your basic essential message for them? In the simplest form, what I can say is that democracy is the only way to have ultimately an opportunity for prosperity and progress. It has to be the element that gives the country stability. It gives the nation uh, continuity of, uh, of political uh, stability, which is conducive to improvement of their lives, feel secure, have their rights protected, uh, know that there's no discrimination at the hand of a system that uh, violates your rights as citizens because of your religion, because of your ethnicity, because of your sexual preference and what have you. In short, democracy is a guarantee for prosperity, stability and progress. And I think they know that. The question is not whether we need it, but how are we going to achieve it? And that's the challenge we face as a nation today. Reza Pahlavi, I'm very grateful for your illuminating insights. And it's been a pleasure to have you on Frankly Speaking. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Frank.